third episode of our Technical Analysis 101 series. And today we're gonna to talk about using technical indicators. Now, uh, before I move into the seminar proper, I just wanna make sure that you guys understand that the way this was taught, as it was taught in a series, because the level of importance start from the very first uh, seminar that we did, and you know it jumps with a little less importance as you go on. However, uh, it doesn't mean that just because it's less important, it means you can't use it. Uh, the whole idea is the whole impact of everything you will learn in these next few sessions used together is where the fullness of the importance of this will be. But if many of you guys are going to be gauging on which should I use first, you should learn trends first as a default and then go into area patterns because it's uh, temporary pauses in trends. And then you look at technical indicators, which we'll cover today to give you a little bit more of some um, uh, depth into the ability for you to be able to look at your analysis and confirm what your suspicions are going to be. All right, so as we come inside to review technical indicators, let's just go and uh, try to make an assessment of what we did in the last um, uh, uh, webinar that we did so we can put everything back to the top of our mind. So last time we talked about corrections and area patterns and just as a summary, uh, we decided to be able to point out to you that there were necessary periods where you would need to be able to scope out the trend lines and sometimes you would see prices attempt to be able to jump up very 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 quickly and these usually leads up into periods of what we call an overbought condition. Now, an overbought condition is a market that's going up too fast too soon. And when a market hits that overbought condition, you'll probably see a, a, a hefty amount of profit taking coming in that would stop the advance and allow prices to be able to pull back. Now, last time we talked about two types of corrections. We said that you could have a correction made out of price. In other words, you will see a pullback in the price. Or sometimes you could see a correction made out in time, which would mean more of a sideways type of pattern, similar to what you see over here. And so these two types of patterns are what markets can either choose. Either one of the two, it doesn't really matter because the whole objective over here is to get it out of the overbought condition, move prices back or allow it to rewind itself so it can regain energy and allow it to cast itself along the trend. So we have here in our example, several conditions that lead up to an overbought situation. And if you notice during that overbought, it may not go down immediately, but uh, you can see that there's quite a struggle in prices attempting to move on. And that's what happens in an overbought market. You're just giving everybody out there the ability to take that profit and they will. And it's because of that, that you see these pullbacks or reactions or consolidations over in time. Similarly, into a downtrend, we see now the opposite condition when prices are falling very, very quickly, leaving your downtrend line behind. And when you get these huge declines, you will now reach an, a point of e exaggeration called an oversold market. And in an oversold market, you will see the opposite type. So in a downtrend, a correction is actually an upward correction as prices come out of that oversold nature, go back towards resistance, and it's here that you should be looking for an opportunity to sell the position. Again, as prices are cast down, it rallies again sideways, and then it falls back down to another oversold condition, and here you are again rallying into the next level of resistance. So the meaningful aspect of what we talked about last time is if you're entering a position, you want to wait for the correction to finish. That'll give you a good uh, uh, handle on things and so that you don't get pushed wayward out of the trend condition. You'll be entering at a more convenient time where risks are relatively low and your upsides are maximized. Now, when we talked about area patterns, we said that uh, area patterns are corrections over in time. And these corrections uh, tend to wind up for a longer period. It could take weeks, could take months, some could even take years but nowadays maybe not so long, but you will see patterns similar to what you get here, consolidations in price. And we have uh, learned last time to be able to identify what they are, what are they called, their particular names involved, and how to watch the demand and supply equation to see if we can generate that feeling that this more likely will go up rather than go down. And by understanding the different types of area patterns, we were able to uh, come around to be able to identify what is stronger, what is weaker, what would eventually create a breakout where prices would punch right through resistance and after the wind up, or what would generally cause a breakdown condition, which is a crack of support after a wind up like what you see over here. 
And we've even discussed even the measuring formula, which gives us the, the ability to look at all of this and understand what the range component will be. So not only can we tell you what a good area to buy will be, but if you were to break out, you would buy towards that breakout and we can even assess how high the price can go in the minimum or in a breakdown condition, how far it can go down. So this becomes very, very powerful as we attempt to be able to use our trends along with our area patterns and understanding what corrections are for so that it can give us the ability to be quite nimble into a market, choose our timing more effectively so we can maximize the potential gains of our trading plans. All right, so with that, let's now step into today's topic. So today we're going to the third part and we're gonna talk about technical indicators. Now, what are technical indicators? Why do we need to use them? And you know, what, what are they for? How, the, how is it constructed? And today we'll talk about the different types of indicators there are. There are what we call overlays. Overlays means that you would put this indicator along with the price of the price chart. Momentum gauges, normally drawn in the bottom of your chart, and you will draw this in direct reference with the prices above it. And oscillators, also drawn usually on the lower end of the chart, and instead of just looking at momentum, what they do is they give you an outline of a high band and low, low band of prices. So but in, an, in the end, by combining these three uh, indicators together, you'd get a much better feel of what prices are attempting to show you. Sometimes a trend could be going up, but you can't see good evidence that momentum seems to be slowing down. And it's because of that that indicators like this will bring out that depth, as I was saying earlier on. And that's why it becomes very important to be able to use indicators. I noticed in the poll that we took on earlier on, um, some of you don't use it. Some of you maybe are more uh, reoccurring the way you guys do it. Some of you don't use it at all. Well, like uh, Ed suggested earlier, maybe after we talk about the substance today, you know how to appreciate the use of it, then I hope that it becomes something um, more second nature to you and you can use it in your daily uh, trade activity because these things can be very important. All right, so in going to technical indicators, let's try to answer that question. What, what, what is it? What is a technical indicator? Uh, as it says here, it's really a gauge that where we study the movement of prices. And we study that gauge because we wanna underlyingly take some sort of information out of that gauge to tell us whether this stock, is it moving up? Is it strong in its ability to move up? Does it have that resilience from, resist, uh, from uh, going down? Or does it look like it's petering out and looks like it's a very timely event for this thing to start correcting or falling? And so these are the types of questions that momentum indicators or technical indicators can help answer for us. And it kind of gives you much better uh, a visual of what it would be rather than just outright guessing whether your stock will continue to climb. And as long as you have this, it becomes quite useful. So I want to be able to give you an analogy. It's like when you ride in your car, and sometimes you may not even know it anymore, but when you make you get into your car, you've got all sorts of gauges around you. You've got your speedometer, you've got your th um, thermometer that measures the heat inside your engine. Then you've got signal lights to tell you left and right, also to warn others about what it is that you're doing. You also have a rear view mirror to be able to see what's going on behind you. And so you may not really use it, but you, you do it every day of your life and become so second nature to you that you don't even bother understanding what you're doing because it becomes automatic. So I hope one day technical indicators become like that to you, second nature. And it becomes so robust into your system that you can call it out anytime you want. Doesn't even matter what stock you pull up or, or currency or commodity. But once you have those indicators in place along with the classical analysis uh, tools, we have like trend line support resistance and area patterns. You can now put them all together and you can feel a much, much better depth into the market that will help you make your assessment and also help you pull that trigger to enter a trade and also help you pull yourself out of one in case the need comes around it. So the job of an indicator should be threefold. First, it's supposed to be able to give you an alert that something's going on, good or bad, it doesn't really matter. We just have to be able to take it as we see it. Second, we'll attempt to confirm some suspicions you have. So for example, if you feel that an uptrend is starting to lose some steam, but you can't seem to verify. So you start looking at one, two or three indicators to see whether it seems to coincide with what it is that you're attempting to be able to pull out. Third, some indicators are a little forward looking because of what they present to you. It might be able to give you a bit more or 
like a little bit look into what the future might hold. And these kinds of indicators can pro prove to be quite um, useful because since it's predicting a potential activity, you become much, much more better prepared to be able to handle whatever is about to come up. I don't know about you, being a trader, one of the things that I'd like is I want to make sure my environment is nice and visible to me. A trader who comes to work and does not review any of these things is a trader that goes into a room blind. And given that blindness, you have no idea what's going to happen. You turn on your terminal, stock starts to move up and down, you're unprepared for what's going on in the trading day. And so you need these gauges to be able to fulfill that element, to give you much more assurance that what you're about to do is not something cast out of a guess, but something that comes in as a scope for something that you've studied, that you've managed to be able to prepare for, and you know what's going to happen. If it goes up, you know what to do. And if it's going to go down, you know exactly what to do. And here you are, a trader whose mind is prepared for that activity of the day. And that's where technical indicators can help a lot. Now, the, the indicators that we'll look at today, um, you know, I can easily tell you there are 30, 40, 50 easily indicators out there more. And people and different techni technical analysts and technicians are probably crafting new ones to be able to explore how, how they can be quite helpful. But today, I'm going to just preview three uh, indicators so you can see how to use them and I'll show you maybe just three more things that I use just so you can get a, a sense of uh, um, uh, the variety of choice that you're going to have and also what not to do when you're looking at indicators because certain indicators don't work well all the time and so as we come around to be able to practice much of these things you have to understand what to use when to use it and when to be able to back off like it says down here Momentum indicators do not work well during consolidations. I'm pulling this out right now because I want you to make sure you understand that a technical indicator, maybe eight out of 10 of them study momentum. How fast is a market moving? And if your market is moving sideways and there is no speed element to study, then it becomes next to useless to be able to look at these indicators because there's no momentum to study. And it, you know, there's no need for you to pull out a, a, an MACD if, for example, the market is moving sideways because it's practically useless in that type of an event. All right, so we'll study all these three. I will put the greatest amount of importance into moving averages. I noticed that uh, in the poll, many of you say that you use it. Well, I hope as I point out to you, you guys are using it the way you should um, because I think moving averages are the most underutilized uh, technical indicator there is. And if you only know how to use it even more, I think it can prove to be very helpful because I use it a lot. And uh, if I were to have taken that poll, I'll probably be using most of this no matter what I do. So I don't execute a trade unless I consult these three guys, uh, just to show you how important these things are to it. So we'll start off with this by doing it one by one. And then we'll try to put them all together in the end. So just so you can see how uh, the variety of these three put together can prove to be quite helpful as a um, gauge consultant of the market. So let's begin with moving averages. All right, so moving average. Now moving average is simply an average of prices given a set number of days. And we will plot a dot across prices to be able to reflect where that particular average is actually sitting. Now the reason it's called a moving average is because if I were to give you the average price, let's say of the last 20 days, then the way I would do that is by calculating like this formula I have down here. So for example, if I want to set the average price in the last 20 days, I will get uh, the closing price of day one plus the closing price of day two and three and four, add them all up, up to reaching the 20th day, and I will divide that entire value by 20. And that becomes my average price for the last 20 days. We will plot that, let's say, as a particular dot somewhere here. Now, tomorrow, we have a new closing price. We will get that closing price, sum it up with the last 20 days, divide by 20, and we will plot it again. And so you will have another dot. By connecting the dots together, you will eventually have a line like this. So now you know why they call it a moving average, because the average moves every day. Every day, you add a new price to it. And so if you notice in the image I have here, here are samples of what moving averages would look like. This orange line is a 20 day EMA or exponential moving average. I'll talk about the different varieties of that in a while. Then the next one is out of 50 days, then 100 days, then 200 days. 
You can clearly see the longer number of days you have, the more graduated it is when it turns around. That's because since you're computing a, a, a bigger amount of days component inside there, it takes a slower time to actually turn that average price around even if you only add one day. And so the more sensitive would be the shorter term moving averages and the less sensitive would be the longer term moving average. Now we'll explain a bit more about that in a little bit. Now why do we want to use a moving average? Well, the reason about moving an average is because one, it can help replace the trend line, right? Now I would suggest that you familiarize yourself first with the use of trend lines before you start doing this so you understand what it does. But trend lines tend to be more exact because since you're talking about an average of price over in time, it might be not as sensitive. It might not be to the dot that you want to be able to move. But it would help that if you if you could just plot it, let the system plot it for you so that you don't even have to draw these lines anymore. It can be very, very useful. And not only that, you can plot several of them at the same time. And so there you can scope various trend elements by doing so. Second, these moving averages tend to act as support and resistance, just like a trend line does. And if you have, let's say, your, your first moving average crap, then you'll use the next moving average to engage your uh, perception of where next support will be. Finally, you can qualify the extent of price correction. So I, I will explain a bit more of that when I go into the next few slides because I'd like to show it to you visually so you can better appreciate what, what I mean by those. But in essence, we use a moving average because it's an indicator I can just plot in the graph immediately without me doing anything, updated every day on its own, and then you just make an assessment based on that visual, and that can prove to be very, very useful. For example, if I can see them plotted out like this and I can scope up for resistance and support areas in just by looking at where the moving averages are, that makes things such so much more quick for me. And I can render an analysis so quickly by simply looking at those lines rather than me having to draw every trend line, every high, every low, connecting them one by one. That could be a bit more tedious. And you know, being a trader, I need to be able to act with greater speed. And in my ability to do that, I want to be able to use these types of indicators to give me a give me a quick assessment. I can always refine my view later on. Okay, now there are normally three types of moving averages, but I will just focus on two first day, and I will only zone in on really one. But for those people who are starting out, you probably want to be able to uh, familiarize yourself with the use of what is known as simple moving averages as compared to exponential moving averages and don't let the word exponential freak you out but simple moving average simply means for every day of activity that you spot that you will get into a sum and divide by a certain number you will put equal weight for every single day of closing that you would get so for example if i'm looking at a five day uh, simple moving average the price of day one two three four and five they're all equal weight at the same time so every five days will be moving on you will get all that just divide it by five and you will get an average of price now an example of what that would look like would look like this green line you see here on the chart this is a simple moving average and, as, and it seems to be do its uh, job well it follows a trend as it goes down when it turns around it gives you a buy signal here when it crosses over and as it climbs up it also seems to be acting at support whenever prices are ducking in so it gives it does its job now since many more experienced traders want a bit more faster or more sensitive activity they've developed what was known as an exponential moving average now the difference is how much weight you put on every single day that trades now to the guy using an exponential moving average it puts a greater amount of impact on that calculation on the most recent day of trading so for example if i'm talking about five days of trading to get a five day simple moving average in an exponential moving average system the more important price there would be the price as of today and i will put slightly greater weight into that price as against what happened five days ago so if you put greater weight inside that means it will be more uh, sensitive to that movement of what happened today and if i were to plot an exponential moving average compared to the simple moving average the exponential moving average is this orange one here and you will notice that it seems to go down faster than the first one or the, the simple 
And when it crosses, it seems to turn itself around faster than the simple moving average does. So that means that this becomes more sensitive. It might be able to key in a quicker buy signal or sell trigger for you if prices move above or below it. And it's for that reason that people tend to use exponential moving averages uh, much more, at least the experts do. But the differences are not so far, especially if you are an extremely short term trader because they tend to look uh, almost the same. But if you're talking about looking at wider time space, like for example, into a uh, talk about six months, one year, two year, there could be a quite a bit of difference between the two. So maybe start off by practicing the simple moving average first. When you get a hang of how to use it, then you probably want to be able to use the exponential moving average because more experienced traders use that. And uh, you'll see that clearly by what happened over here. Now, I'd like to talk about the periodic condition of time element here. Now, you could actually draw several moving averages together. Now, I want you to be able to understand that you should be using the moving averages that fit the trading time that you're trading in. Now, what I mean by that is if you decide to trade into the short term, then you probably want to be able to use a narrower amount of time element to, for that moving average so that it's much more sensitive. For example, if you're going to be a short term trader, you probably want to use a 10 or 20 day EMA. So when you say 10 or 20 days, that's 10 or 20 days exponential moving average. And so that's 10 days of trading or 20 days of trading, you're going to scope into that trend. Those things tend to move much faster. If you're going to be trading the medium term, then you extend the time element. Maybe you use a 50 or 100 day, as we pointed out over here. And if you decide to go a longer term in your trading uh, aspect, then you probably want to look at the 200 day or a 400 day EMA to assess the longer term trends. That's possible for you to plot them all at the same time, right? And sometimes you might want to do it, especially if prices are going from one to another and you want to get a sense of, of depth of how far this price can move. And I'll give you an example of that. So here's an example of a moving average where I plotted all those moving averages that I've uh, looked out for you. So here you have a 20 day, 50 day, then you have a 100 day, a 200 day and a 400 day uh, exponential moving average. Labels are here on the upper right hand side. Now, I don't want every chart you look at to have them. There's really no need for that. I think you should just plot it out whenever you actually need to be able to use them so that it doesn't become too confusing and it puts a lot more less clutter in the visual you're looking at so that you can zone in and appreciate what short term trends are doing and what signals you're seeing there. If I put too many images, I mean, you can just look at the chart I'm seeing right now. It can get quite messy and you're trying to figure out which is crossing over which one and it, it makes things a bit more difficult. But I'm just doing this to be able to stress something that uh, I want you to learn how to use with this. So to be able to use a moving average, we will use it by giving us two basic signals. The first is a moving average break. Now, what that means is if prices have been climbing like this, and as long as prices seem to be climbing and falling to it and then rallying again, falling it to the moving average and rebounding, as long as we don't get a significant cross below it or a significant support break below it, then the idea is you follow that trend and you don't sell your position. And you use opportunities to rebound from that moving average to buy. And so this is a buy condition here, 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 here. And you should be holding that through until prices actually rupture through your moving average. So if I was using a short term trading system, I would use a short term moving average that would be this one and this one, the 20 and 50 day. And if prices either break through this or break through the next one, then I will just stop my position out and I will get up. If I was a medium term trend follower, then I will wait for the 100 or two. Uh, the 100 or 200 day to be able to stop me out will be here. And just in case I'm using a longer term system, then maybe if it break the last one you see here, then I would just be completely out. Also, if I'm following a medium term trend and I'm trading that time, you should be looking for potential rebounds from the medium term a moving average to be able to get in. So simply just use that. Now, one little note. Use the moving average that exists here like a trend line. So for example, if you notice this trend line here seems to be following the 20 day moving average. Once prices fall below it and they crack below that support, and just like a trend line would break, you should remove or lighten down your position. That's a sell trigger. And in a sell trigger in, MAC, in a moving average, it follows in the same context. 
Now, after your first shorter term moving average breaks, you will go to the next one. So just follow the order down here. So the 20 day moving average breaks, then you will follow the 50 day as your next support. If the 50 day moving average breaks, you will go to the next, the 100 day to act as support. If your 100 day breaks, you will go down to the 200 day as the next support. And if the 200 day breaks, you will go down to the 400 day and you start as your support. So just that alone will show you how fast that you can uh, make an assessment of the trend condition. How far should this thing fall down? Where do I anticipate that a potential support site could be? And it's helpful to be able to make this type of understanding, especially if you're trying to figure out where I should be looking as a possibility to enter. So if you get rebounds from here, you can go ahead and buy it. If it breaks through your moving average, then you're supposed to sell it. Now, the second way of using uh, moving average system is using a, what is known as a crossover system. Now, a crossover system means this. If a shorter moving average, let's say this example I have on top, this light blue one here, if the shorter term moving average crosses over a slightly longer term moving average, like what we have here, the purple one, then that tells you this, that that short term selling force, which should have been short term, seems to be picking up speed. And if it's strong enough to be able to break through another moving average, that means there's this big selling force that seems to be backing this change of trend. And it could unleash something much more viable into a downside. And so a crossover system can do that. There's some system that introduced, maybe you probably heard of something called a golden cross, right? And when you've got this bearish or bullish crosses, where let's say a 50 day moving average crosses over a 200 day moving average or vice versa, and it usually tells you the major trend event is changing and that you may have to prepare that a wider trend involvement is coming into place. So in this case here, as a short term moving average is crossing over a longer term moving average, you can see the impact on the trend seems to be quite apparent and quick. Prices fall down right, right away. And then it starts to rebound again, gives you an opportunity to be able to lighten or maybe even make a short trade here. But the minute you see cross downs again on your moving averages here, plus they've been crossing down over a 200 day moving average, that is what they there's something big coming here that's coming to the equation, forcing prices down faster than they should. And you should really anticipate that something's about to happen that could be quite uh, forceful into the downside. So actually what happened here in Megaworld after this, and because of the crossover system, is really telling you warning, 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 and that you should be lightening. And this eventually went to one peso and 50 cents. So here's where a crossover system can prove to be quite useful and so that you can align yourself with what the trend involvement is and you can just back off very quickly. But every time you see rebounds from moving averages, that could be an opportunity for a buy, especially if you're using a short, medium, or long-term trend. Now let's talk about how we gauge these types of reactions. Now I want to be able to break this down into basically three phases. So if you're looking at a strong uptrend and you're looking for opportunities to get in, you should be looking for what is known as retracement swings. What does that mean? Retracements are minor corrections. These are pullbacks in prices where you will see that prices will only go back maybe through your 20 or 50 day EMAs. So if you look at the example that I have here, here's an example of a very strong stock. This was DNL before, and it was going very, very strongly on the upside. And look, every once in a while, it will back off to the purple line. This is a 50-day uh, moving average. And after doing that, then it darts up right away. Consolidates, comes closer to the 50-day, pushes up right away. Corrects back to it, pushes up right away. And then you've got these minor breaks. And here's where you see when those breaks come in, normally, remember, when a trend change comes, Remember, there are three trends, not two. So just because an uptrend breaks a trend line or breaks a moving average, it does not automatically follow that it will go down because there's, an, there's another trend it can do and which means it could go sideways. Okay, so just understand that. So when you get a moving average break or a trend line break, your uptrend switches, but it could switch from either a sideways market or to a downward one. And you have to let it give you some time to acknowledge that. But since you're looking to be able to jump into the bandwagon here as the uptrend is quite forceful, you will wait for these pullbacks to the 20 or 50 day moving average. A rebound from that area will give you an opportunity to be able to buy it. Now, a reset. Now, reset is a second type of, of uh, heavier correction. And instead of falling down to the 20 or 50 day, here's where prices will fall all the way back down, maybe to your 200 or even 400 day EMA. 
Now, the reason I'm pointing that out is because here's an example of Security Bank uh, a few years ago. And again, it was a very forceful during this period. And like we were saying earlier, retracement, 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 buy, buy, buy. And then it shot up incredibly uh, fast going to an overbought situation. And then look what happened. It just sliced right through the moving average without stopping. And that only tells you that the market perhaps had faced its buying effect out, it became exhausted, and prices are now working itself to come back down. The break of that moving average tells us now I got a scope to the next level, let's say 200 and 400 days. And you can see what happens here. It stops close to it, tries to rebound and consolidate, and then another crap takes place and it falls all the way down to your 400 day moving average. Now, what is a reset as compared to retracement? Normally, in a very big trend move, you probably find much more much more retracements rather than resets. Resets come in once in a blue moon. And the reason a reset comes in is because the market has gone up too much. And that overbought condition is not even showing not only in a daily chart, but could also be showing in a weekly chart or maybe even a monthly chart. And that's telling you that there's too many people making money out there and they're looking for an opportunity to cash in on that profit and drive prices back down. <coughs> it could also be. Uh, something could happen to a company that could stump, you know, allow a stumbling block to happen and force it to make a natural correction because of that. Remember, sometimes companies are not going to show you robust earnings all the time. There could be some setbacks. It could be a setback because something in society has taken place that is temporary and you will get these pullbacks in price. So here, for example, what happened in Security Bank, it fell all the way back to your 400 day moving average and then recovered, created a temporary pattern and then eventually broke out and set itself up right from there. So if you were a medium to long term type of trader, you'd be looking for opportunities like this to be able to buy back inside. Also, usually after a reset, that is a significant correction already. And that means a downside risk from there are very, very minimal unless something is wrong, either in the environment or either in the company that might force what is known as a trend change. And we'll talk about that. So a trend change is how we would identify what is known as a reversal. So a reversal is when prices fall even below the 400 day moving average. And all of a sudden, you can see that things turn quite dire in this case, a massive sell off coming in, breaking through the moving average, consolidating and pitching down all over again. So after that 400 day or maybe even two or 400 day moving average breaks, I think you should be very defensive of it. You might ask the question, what's going on here? Something more impactful or lengthy might be happening to be able to keep prices into that downtrend. And it's because of that, that you pull out, you more likely you, have, you shouldn't be there anymore. And that means you will only come back into the stock after things turn around and they finally show you uptrends once again. And that's why we call it a reversal because it confirms a change of trend. And that is the reversal prospect that the moving average can confirm to you. And so remember, once a reversal comes in, we're supposed to stay out of that. And you wait for trends to eventually change. Maybe if this eventually punches above these moving averages up here, then I will look at it again for a potential buyback. But then while prices are staying below those moving averages, I will stay away. All right, let's have a look at a sample and how to be able to call up a moving average. And let's try to be able to figure out how to be able to use it here in the case of SM. Okay, so as we're looking at SM investments, we can see a clear uptrend from this area here and then a downtrend that comes into there. But like I said, it's naked without a moving average. So let's put some. So by clicking the studies, click on moving average. And here you may have to modify some details. So let's put a 20 day and let's change it to exponential and let's change the color to uh, this almost green like color. All right, so this line is a moving average, right? And you can clearly see how prices seem to be, to be in an uptrend wanting to stand over it. Now let's put another one so we can have another reference point. Let's leave the 50, let's change it to exponential and let's leave it, uh, let's color it the same color, red. Okay, so now I have two moving averages plotted in here. So just by looking at this alone, in an uptrend, as long as prices stand above those two moving averages, I will try to stick with my position or look for an opportunity to buy in this rebounds like this and then do it the same thing all the way up 
until one day prices rupture between, let's say, the two moving averages you see, just like you see here and here, right? After the trend change takes place, look what happens. Prices seem to be having a hard time climbing above this moving average. There was an attempt up here, but it fell back right away. Again, you can see the moving averages blocking the upward path again, acting as resistance. And so you can see it can prove to be very, very useful to be able to plot this out automatically. Now I'm going to put one more. Let's put a 400-day moving average exponential. And let's color this like a darker color. Okay. Here we go. So I just wanted to see, here's an example of a reset where prices pulled back all the way up to your 400-day, rebounded, made a higher low right here. And eventually broke its if you have the trend line here and now you can see that your moving average is also attempting to show good reading in fact if you were to be able to look over here you can see that the shorter term moving average is crossing the longer term moving average plus you're seeing prices demonstrate a breakout condition from the pattern that you see over here after a viable decline and that tells you that this market should be ready to move it's corrected enough. All the people who wanted to sell are probably out. It's prepared itself with a nice setup pattern, a small rectangular pattern. MAC, the moving average over here is telling you that it's finally moving back into an uptrend and you should have been participating in a buy over this range. So here's a very useful aspect of how to be able to use those moving averages. And maybe you know something like this, you could just stay out for the meantime. Also, Look at this area here. If some of you were just gonna use the price to be able to buy above the moving average, um, this is why the crossover system sometimes can be very useful. You, although the price crossed over, the moving average did not cross over the longer term moving average. And here's where sometimes it could help prevent you from buying too early. So if this would have crossed over similar to what you've seen here, then it gives you a much more timely entry telling you that all the pieces are in place for this to be able to turn around. And so. It, if you notice, even the slight breakout over here from this moving average that was not confirmed by this moving average below it. And it's because of that, that I would not have gotten fooled to buying this because this did not give me a proper setup. So take advantage of what this can offer you because moving average can be quite uh, useful. You plot it immediately and they become readily available for your use immediately. All right, let's go to the second indicator, the MACD. Now, the MACD is actually built on a moving average system. In fact, the name MACD uh, stands for Moving Average Convergence Divergence Indicator. Uh, so you know, there are two big heavy words over here, and that's why we simply just use MACD and not call it this. And what we're gonna be doing now is we wanna be able to understand how to be able to better use this. Now, this is a bit more complex, so I'm gonna need you to be able to pay attention right now to be able to understand how to be best use this. Now, the MACD has three lines. We have the first line, which is the MACD line. That is this red line you see here. <clears throat> then we have the signal line, which trails or follows the MACD line. That's this blue line that you see here. Now, mind you, uh, depending on the charting system you use, some charting systems could color this in very different colors. In my example, the faster moving line is the MACD, which is in red, and the slower um, uh, line is what we call the signal line. This signal line is actually just a moving average of the MACD. And that's a reason why it trails the MACD because you're getting an average price of the MACD computation. Now there's a third line here called the zero line. And I'll talk about these three lines and how to use them together. So the zero line is this flat line you see across the chart here in the bottom. If you notice the indicator zero stands right here. Now, I would just draw a line so that you can see it, but normally charting systems don't draw this line. So I'm just drawing it just so you can see it a bit more clearly. But here's the zero line we see here. Zero line represents zero momentum. So if this red MACD line were to stand right on that zero, that would mean that the MACD is telling you the market has zero speed. It's neither accelerating upwards nor accelerating downwards. So acceleration, you might ask, well, the MACD is really a momentum tool. So the way we're gonna use it is like a speedometer in your car. We wanna see whether your stock is accelerating going up or is it decelerating or could it be accelerating going down or decelerating from its decline. And that's what this MACD tool will allow us to be able to generate. So let's look at this two together first. Now let's see how to be able to use this in a trading condition, the MACD and a signal line. Now the way it works is this way. 
if the MACD is standing above the signal line, all right, then you have what is known as a buy mode or a buy situation. So for example, in this case here, this is a buy situation where the red line is trading over the signal line or your MACD is above the signal line. So this remains into buy mode all the way through until the MACD crosses below the blue line, in which case this becomes a sell. Again, as you go all the way back down here, if the red line crosses above the signal line or the MACD goes above the signal line, this is a buy, or what we call a positive crossover. And it remains in buy mode all the way through until your MACD line in red here crosses below the blue line. And this is a negative crossover. And that means you should look to sell or take profits from the situation that you're being looked at. So just keep in mind that that's how you use the MACD and signal line. I'll go into it in the, to the next slide, but just keep that in mind right now. Now remember, as long as the red line is below the, or the MACD line is below the signal line, you remain in sell mode. And that means you shouldn't be touching this until a potential buy situation comes in somewhere like this or somewhere like this. So we'll, we'll go into that in a, in a little bit. Now let's talk a little bit about what does that mean, positive momentum and negative momentum. So with the MACD standing over the zero line, like the way you see majority of the time it is over here, that means if it's up, it's showing you a positive momentum, that means you're looking at a trend that is generally upwards. And so in an uptrend, what should you be spending your time doing? You should be spending your time looking for potential buys, okay? Now, if you are into the negative territory or you see the MACD goes below zero, then no more buying. You want to be able to say the market's more corrective in nature right now, and I'm going to back off for the meantime, and I'm not going to look for an opportunity to buy until I see that MACD go above the zero line. And so a lot of books don't teach you how to do that. They will tell you automatically buy crossover, hit it, even if it's below the zero line. Um, it may work sometimes, but I will tell you, imagine if you're buying down there, you're likely downtrending at that moment and you probably feel a lot of heavy resistance climbing or you might see a lot of choppiness take place before the price will actually move. So I would suggest that you wait for the MACD to go over the zero line to give you a better impact on what the potential trade element will be. So when we come around to be able to do this, we want to be able to understand. So what should I be looking at as a potential signal for the MACD? Now in the MACD, um, it will come up and give you either buy, sell, or a hold system here. That way we can outline things more clear. So in the example that we have here in SM Prime, we'll try to be able to narrate to you how the MACD works. So when should I follow a buy signal using that MACD? First, the first element we should have is this. Your MACD line or your red line should have crossed above or is standing over your signal line. So in this area here, when the red line crosses over the blue line, that means you're in buy mode and it stays in buy mode all the way till this area right here. Now there's a second element that I want you to, to be able to follow. Not only should it be in buy mode, but your MACD should be standing above the zero line and it should be showing you a positive trend event. I don't want you to be buying a stock that's on a downtrend. Because it happens sometimes that in a downtrend, your MACD could give you a buy signal because it's trying to price in a potential technical recovery or a little rally. Look at the example I have over here. Here, your price is falling back down, and then they start to cascade sideways. Your MACD, way below the zero line, now crosses over the, the signal line in this case here. Now, the question is, this is a buy mode, yes, but should I follow this buy signal? No, you should not buy this. In fact, the only thing you should be doing is just stop your selling activity because it's telling you a little rally is coming. And in that rally, you should be using that rally as an opportunity to sell the position, not to take in a new long position or to buy a new position. So please understand that difference. So if you're in a downtrend, you shouldn't be accumulating that stock while that downtrend proceeds. You should be waiting for this trend to eventually turn around and then position yourself into, into this condition. Now you might ask, shouldn't it be taking advantage of lower prices? Well, yes, if you're a fundamental analyst because you're supposed to be buying cheap. But remember, we're a technician. 
And a technician follows timing and follows trends. And we do not enter too early in a downtrend because that downtrend could exist for the next week, two weeks, 10 months. We don't know. And so we have to make sure that we're scoping what that condition is. So in this condition, you see a cell mode here. It begins somewhere here. You can see a loss of momentum. That's what this is telling you. A cell mode is triggered. We take our profit. We stay out of this trend. Now in this case, it tells you there's a little buying situation going on here, but it's way below the zero line, as you can see. So that means, okay, we have a technical rally taking place, but not good enough for us to buy. And if you notice, look at the rally. It's hardly amounted to anything. It just moved sideways and eventually it broke down all over again and the downtrend proceeded all over again and it went back into sell mode right after. So take heed when this, this MACD conditions are telling you, if it's way below your zero line and you're getting a buy condition, back up from that trade, don't take that. Now, one more thing I want to be able to point out over here, how do I know I should be holding a position using the MACD? Now we go back to an uptrend like we see here. I want you to be able to look at the MACD in this area here. And you will notice this. You will notice that the difference between the MACD and the signal line seem to be getting wider. In other words, they're expanding the difference between the two. And if you notice in this little histogram tool we have here in the bottom, this is not volume. This is just showing what is the difference in price between this red line and this blue line or the MACD and signal line. And if you see the lines are expanding or climbing this way, that tells you momentum on the uptrend is picking up, accelerating. So this is like your speedometer. It's like you're gaining speed. So even if prices have climbed up, let's say from here to here on this day, and you'll be wondering, oh God, I've really seen quite good gains, but you can see momentum is still picking up. So it should tell you don't sell yet because allow yourself, allow this trend to be able to bring out more for you. Because if this thing starts to slow down, then that's the time you worry. But if momentum is showing a very wide berth, just like you see here, the difference is becoming wider. It's very hard to turn that around and let this price go down. Before it does that, it might even move sideways first. In fact, that's exactly what happened. You notice a sideways movement came first, gave you ample enough time to be able to get out of the position. And if you did it on the sell mode here, it'd be way okay because you wouldn't have been participating in this decline. Next, into a decline like this, you will notice that even the MACD in this stage over here is also getting wide, if you notice the decline. This is also telling you, yes, it may have fallen quite a bit, but that downtrend effect is still in place and there's heavy selling uh, um, uh, actions taking place that could drive this down. So as long as the wideness are showing here, that means this could continue to go down and you can see that's why from here, from this wide space here, you can see the prices continue to go down. Took a pause, rewound and then continue to fall down nevertheless. So here the MACD could prove it to be quite useful tool to be able to gauge that condition. Okay, now let's look at this situation over here. I know there's a lot of signals here, but I'll walk you through it piece by piece. Now, since the MACD is a momentum signal, you have to be careful about those moments when there is no momentum in the market. So it's fine. You can use the MACD every time you see trends like this are nice forceful going up or going down. But the minute you see it lock it itself into a pattern like this, sideways movement, any of the area patterns we talked about in our last webinar, then your reliance on that MACD should drop down incredibly. And instead, start focusing only on this range that you're looking at. And that's, here's an example of what I was telling you earlier. In terms of importance, trend lines first, area patterns next, momentum or indicators last. So if you do see a trend line, use your trend line tools and you do that first. If you see an area pattern, this is more important than looking at MACD. So you use your range that you see here. But once a stock breaks out of an area pattern, you can now reuse the importance of your MACD to call back into confirming the activities of your trade. All right, let's have a look at it here. It says your consolidations can produce erratic MACD reads. I just wanna show you what that means. So in a basic upward environment, it gave you a buy signal here, which we will not follow first, but it's only when the MACD climbs above the zero line that we will actually buy. That would be on this day right here. So pretty good. And it went up 
almost crossed down, but did not cross down uh, completely. So no sell trigger uh, took place. You should be holding your position. And because of that, wound up a bit, found its way back to the trend line and went back up. But over here, you can see that the MACD started to lose some steam. And you can see a wider pullback. In fact, it broke through the trend line uh, in this condition, only to be able to show you a confirmation of what the MACD is telling you. So the MACD is telling you, oops, time to take your profit. So unwind some of your positions first. And your MACD starts to go down as prices run down, consolidates, and your MACD goes all the way back down near the zero line and crosses up. Again, in a cross up, you should follow the buy signal. But I want you to be already be alert that since a trend line was broken, that the uptrend's force is starting to lose steam, and there's a wide, a very great possibility that consolidation will come out, and it did so in this particular case. So if you do see what happened, gave you a buying signal here, but it allowed you to be able to sell somewhere here. You made very little money, but the reason for that really is because it was locking itself up into a range. After it crosses down, it crosses up again, then it crosses down. When you get these erratic buy-sell movements in a matter of days, sometimes very quickly, you know you're in a consolidation. And in a consolidation, drop the use of the MACD and simply look at the range pattern involved. And once you start scoping your highs and lows, you can buy closer to the rebounds of support and sell closer to the areas of resistance as we mentioned last time. Once we get a breakout uh, condition like this, and you get a buy crossover in your MACD that confirms the purchase so you can launch your attack to buy the stock back here. Now, prices uh, almost crossed down but bounced from the moving average and it held itself back. Remember also what we talked about in the last two uh, webinars we did, former resistance now acting as support. So you should be looking for potential buy somewhere over here. And now prices recovered to this area and you can see that prices are still quite strong. MACD is telling you, hold your position because it's not giving you a sell trigger yet. So it becomes very useful to be able to, to, to listen to those MACDs. I know there will be times when MACDs will prove tough to use, and the reason for that is because it's consolidated. So don't blame on the MACD. Perhaps you're just seeing the new area pattern build now, and that's why it may look confusing. But the minute you see these crossovers that don't work very well, I'm almost sure 90% of the time you have an area pattern being built. So Rely now on the area pattern rather than MACD. Okay, let's show you how to be able to draft the MACD in our programs. Okay, so we have here a chart of Globe Telecom, and I wanted to show this you know, nice spike. We'll click on studies again, we'll look for the MACD indicator here, click on it. Now, just leave everything as it is, but you might want to change the color to what we were using uh, MACD red, signal blue, so we can see. Uh, what we're looking at. We'll just draw this up so you can see it better. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the corrections that we've seen from this area here. You can clearly see the MACD is pointing downwards. And if I were to draw a little trend line here for you, I guess you can get better assessment of why your MACD is here and is standing below the zero line. Then a crossover takes place. Uh, remember what I told you earlier, this crossover is taking place, but it's below the zero line Okay, and it's because of that that it took some time and even retested the low before trying to break out. But during the breakout time, this is where a little wind up comes in. Your MACD is now trading above the zero line. You should now follow the buy signal to be able to ride on the position. Now, as it's climbing, momentum starts to slow down, a crossover takes place at about this area, and a new area pattern is now being built. I'll just draw a little consolidation here for you. Okay, and now, you can see what happens, MACD starts to fall. Let's see what happened after this. And now after the little move, we'll just extend our pattern a bit so you can see what it looks like. So we have a rectangular pattern taking place. And now let's go back to your MACD. Your MACD is about to cross over your signal line, but we have a problem. We're stuck in an area pattern. So your MACD tells me there's a potential buy situation, but there's no area pattern break. So let me show you what happened in the past. This is the same company, went up, MACD, crossover down the downside, and there's a slight buy crossover here. Now again, I'll draw an air, the range pattern for you. So we have like a rectangle or a decelerating channel here. And I wanted to show you, same thing happened, potential breakout, but crossover, 
but I had to wait for the breakout to take place. If I bought this too early, look what would have happened to me. It would have failed going up and it would have landed all the way back down. And then, of course, you have prices moving all the way back down with your MACD also dropping below zero line. So again, use area patterns first rather than your MACD. If you're in an area pattern, there is no breakout. It doesn't matter if your average is crossing up. I want you to wait for a breakout condition because that's more important to signal than this is. But if a breakout comes in and this continues to move up, go ahead and follow the MACD signal. Okay, let's look at the third type of technical indicator, relative strength. Now, if you notice the MACD and the relative strength, these are indicators that we draw below a chart as against an overlay, which is drawn into the chart itself of where the price is. That's the difference between the type of indicator we have. Now, the RSI or the relative strength index is also a momentum indicator. However, it works differently. What it, it, it is also known as an oscillator because I don't know if you've ever seen a heart uh, rate machine. It bounces to and fro a set range. It goes up and down just to show you how, how wild your heartbeat is. But the upper boundary and the lower boundaries have a fixed range. And so does the RSI. Its range is from zero up to 100. Now, here's what that RSI looks like. That's this chart that you see here in the bottom, okay? Now, in this particular chart, you have two lines that are drawn along your RSI, this one in red and this one in blue. Uh, again, certain charting programs may draw those horizontal lines in different colors. So just remember the upper boundary line, which is normally drawn either in a 70% zone or 80% zone, and the lower boundary line, which is drawn either in a 30% or 20% zone. And this is how I'm gonna show you how to be able to use this. All right, so we have a price um, trend going up here. Here's your main trend line climbing. Now, every once in a while, you have this uptrend showing some cascade in price, and let's try to an analyze why. You see a strong rebound coming in here, and after a very, very nice pickup in price. Let's look at the RSI. Here's the RSI, and you can see in this stage here, it crosses above this 70% zone, and you can see that it, it's now shaded in red, and that tells you there's an overbought condition in the stock as of current. And that overbought condition means that stock went up too much too soon, and it might create some degree of profit taking uh, problem soon. And sure enough, look what happens. The price eventually goes sideways and turns back down, lands back to the trend line, and it's in the trend line where there is bigger support and a rebound takes place. So what should I have done here? So in a case like this, I'd be looking to buy and hold the position, and as prices seem to be going through an overbought condition, you are to stop your buying. If you want to take some profits here, fine, but maybe you should take 10, 20% or 30% of your position. You should still hold your stock because generally this is still an uptrend. Although the stock price could pull back, remember, it could actually just go sideways and not actually go all the way back down to the trend line. So in a case like that, you want to maintain a core position in your, in your strategy and a trading position you will take or you will take profits off when you see overbought conditions inside. But please, in an overbought condition, all buying stops. You should be buying only when it's no longer overbought and preferably when prices are bouncing over your support. Okay, second situation, it rebounds, goes all the way back up here. You notice your RSI flags you again, second time overbought again because it crosses over the 70% zone. Look what happens to the price after it climbs, it, can't, it struggles, it goes sideways. Now eventually it climbs up again, but it took time to be able to do that. It took almost a month to be able to consolidate before continuing. Again, it moves up, hit, hits the upper boundary of the range and starts to pull back. Only in this time, it did not hit the overbought condition and I'll explain to you why in this case it did not. The reason for that is because it took a lengthy consolidation time here and allowed the stock to rewind. And this means that because of this wind up, this could actually have passed this even a little bit more before going into an overbought situation. But it followed the rules nevertheless and eventually it backed back off, prices fell back down. So anytime this is not in an overbought condition, that should contribute to the fact that you can look for an opportunity to buy there. But again, the perfect scenario here is wait for prices to come closer to your support area, and these are better areas for you to buy rather than closer to the upper boundary of the line. Then here we have another move. This time it moves quite strongly all the way back up, 
RSI shows you another overbought reading, and after that, prices make a reaction once again. So you can clearly see the advantage of understanding where is this overbought threshold. Because when you see this overbought threshold, it wants you right away stop your buying. You might even think about doing some selling, but keep your core position intact. The only time your core position should be sold is when this major down, uh, uptrend line here is broken and you see a warning that tells you a change in trend has taken place. Other than that, keep it very much in, in, in hold and just use maybe up to 10, 30% of your position to take profits into these high band areas then. Now, these areas are example of overbought conditions and overbought conditions should only be looked for when you are in an uptrend. In a downtrend, you will rarely, if ever, see an overbought situation because they will not go overbought in a declining trend. In a declining trend, you will see an oversold situation. So in an oversold market, what you're supposed to be doing there is looking for an opportunity to sell, not an opportunity to buy because you're in a downtrending environment. However, if you see a stock plunge and it falls into an oversold state, you should stop selling a position that you still have, assuming you're, want, you're wanting to sell it, and you should wait instead for a major rally to come out to bring it out of an oversold state and sell it once it's no longer oversold. And that's how you're supposed to use an over, overbought and oversold system. Now, the RSI has a magic ability. I didn't just place it here for that to tell you overbought and oversold. You can probably get that feel or a hang of it eventually over time. But you see the RSI has another hidden um, a substance inside it. It has this new, new thing called divergence. Now, divergence is simply a lapse in the market strength that we want to be able to pick out. And I'll show you an example of how to be able to look for such divergence so it can help you uh, sometimes when you spot it out uh, appropriately. Now, divergence is a lap in strength, as it says here, or, or weakness, and it's shown by showing you a signal in the RSI, either in its tops or bottoms, as you compare it against the tops and bottoms of the price of the stock. So let's have a look here. So here we have an uptrending situation, and let me try to identify what that divergence looks like. Here you see an uptrend. Here is a Boitis power going to this high, corrects for a while, rallies back and makes a new high, and only to find out that prices are correcting once again. Now, that's normal, nothing too adversely impactful of something like this. But let's look at the RSI now. Here's your RSI. Did it hit an overbought reading when this went up? Yes, it did. Now, the next time it climbed up and went to a new high, even with a forceful move, let's see what the RSI did at that time. If you notice the RSI here, it climbed up to here. It didn't even go to an overbought territory. In fact, the high that you see here is actually lower than the high that it met out in the first condition. This is known as divergence. When you see a higher high in your price, just like this, and you don't see a higher high or the same high in your RSI, that tells you that momentum, upward momentum, has shown a lapse in its strength and that a potential wider correction may be coming in place. Look what happened to this after this divergence had taken place. And you see, what happened to avoid this power is it went right through the floor and fell down quite horrendously. And there's no way to predict that. Maybe if you had an MACD, you probably would get a good reading. But if you were just using this alone, that wouldn't have helped you. But look at the RSI, giving you what is known as a bearish divergence, alerting you that a potential wider reaction is about to come. And sure enough, it did this. If you were able to see the signal earlier on when it was here, you could have saved a lot of money instead of riding this through all the way back now. Now let's give you another example of that different types of divergence. This is known as bearish divergence because what it does is it announces a bearish swing. Here, we're going to give you an example of a bullish divergence. Mm -hmm. This is ICTSI. Here, we have a downtrend. And you can see a downtrend here, technical recovery, falls back down and makes a lower low. Again, low, lower low. So let's just connect these two together. And now let's look at the RSI. So the RSI did generate an oversold condition as it did here. Rallied back, it also hit an oversold condition. But look at what happened. Here we have price going from a low to a lower low. Here we now have the RSI bottom, finding an RSI bottom, which is higher than the previous one. 
This is called bullish divergence. What that means is that it's telling you that the seller who's selling this is running out of steam and that more likely a major market rally could be up forward here. And so if you get an announcement like that, it could say prepare for a major rally coming inside. You could now look for potential positioning over here given this condition. Let's see what happened after this bullish divergence taken place. So you can see a very forceful advance had taken place in ICT and this was alerted way in advance predicted by the bullish divergence that you've seen here. So this is why we look at the RSI. One, to give us an overbought and oversold condition and second, to give us a notion of divergence to be able to help us out in spotting major market tops or major market bottoms. And this becomes very useful when you plug them into conditions like this so I can make a good clear hand of what trend assessments are taking place. All right, let's now try to be able to look at an example of how to be able to plot out the RSI in our charting app. All right, today's example, we're gonna study uh, east-west. Now we do have, of course, an uptrend floating right here. Okay, and now let's try to be able to make an assessment by uh, uh, looking at the RSI indicator. All right, so RSI, we find it here. Just leave everything as is except for this. I'm going to change this into 80% to 70%. On the bottom, I will make 30%. I will change the color. I will make the top overbought red and the oversold, I'll make it blue so you guys can see it. So here we have it in the bottom. This is the RSI. We'll just widen this. Okay. Now you can see, I will just draw a trend line here so you can we can help us make an assessment of the trend condition. All right. Now, if you see here, very, very strong rush in prices leading up to an overbought condition. Also here, after rushing up in July, strong overbought conditions. And look what happens to the price after the overbought condition. It generates a consolidating band for prices to be able to go back to the trend line and then explode and then overbought again, cascade down into a corrective element. So here you can see how the overbought element works. Now let's move over in time. Now I'll just expand this a bit as the trend continues. Okay, let's look at this high and draw a line to the higher high, which we see here. And let's look at your RSI compared to the next one here. And you can clearly see this is a lower high. And so that tells me alert, alert, wider correction may be coming in view here. And if you notice, it did pull back, it broke through the trend line, and look what just happened. And to continue the story, after it fell, it went to an oversold condition, as you see here. Oversold means it needs to rebound for a time. And sure enough, a rebound took place and climbed back up, up to the high, uh, at least this area here towards the near closer to 1330 or 1340. So again, what do I do down here in an oversold condition? I will stop my setting and I will renew my setting only if this comes up to the next resistance, maybe closer to the breakdown zone here. And this area might be a better area to sell rather than this oversold condition that you have. So in this chart, I showed you how to be able to draw the RSI. You used your trend line to help make an assessment. We've noted the divergence that came in that alerted a wider correction that taking place. And so it can prove very useful for us to make an assessment of a trend condition, whether it's too much or, or let's say it's fallen down too much or gone up too much and what divergence can offer up some potential corrective situation into the market. Okay. So now let's have a look at two uh, sample stocks we have here. But this time I'm gonna throw the moving averages inside. I'm gonna put the MACD along with it and I'm also gonna put the RSI along with it. My recommendation, if you're gonna put indicators along with your chart, I would recommend start first with one, practice on how it's used, then add maybe your second. And then if you, if you, if you can, maybe up to three maximum. So in other words, you can put several moving averages, the MACD and the RSI, all the three things we studied today, and that be the fulfillment of it. I would not recommend that you have more than maybe three or five or 10 indicators in your chart all at once. Because if you have too many indicators, you honestly will not know who to listen to. All right, that's too many masters talking. And like they say, I can only follow one master. So if I have here, in this case, I can only follow three because if I have four or five or six, I'll go crazy. And I don't know where to turn and I don't know which indicator to be able to help me make an assessment. So two to three indicators are good enough. And it is preferred 
that the indicators you use don't do the same thing. For example, it's okay to have an RSI, which is an oscillator. It's okay to have one momentum gauge, like your MACD. And it's okay to have your moving average because it's an overlay, right? Because here you're making an assessment of support. Here you're looking at speed. RSI, you're looking whether it's overbought or oversold or divergence, right? So I wouldn't recommend that you be putting, let's say, an MACD here with stochastics, with another momentum indicator, because they all do the same thing. Right, so try to be able to use a, a variety of indicators that don't do the same thing, and you're trying to get confirmation from each so they can give you better assessment of your market condition. Okay, so let's look at, look at FGen in this example. Now, if you notice, FGen is going through a corrective period here, a consolidation, and if you notice this push up here, breaking over the band that you see, that is a potential breakout situation. Now. Let's try to make an assessment based on each indicator that we've studied so far. Let's start with the moving average. So your moving averages, the question is, is the price now above or below your moving averages? It is actually above all three that we have plotted in here. So that means if the price is standing over these moving averages, I could say the stock price or this is now above its short term, medium term and long term trend, let's say. And so if all trends are pointing up, that's a good standing for me to be in. And that should could complement my buy signal on the breakout. Second, let's make an analysis based on your MACD. Now, MACD, and as far as this is concerned, is showing me a buy trigger. Okay, if you, here's an example where the MACD is the black line now and the signal line is red. And that's why I told you sometimes do take check this very well. Not every red line is automatically MACD. It's the faster moving line that is the MACD and the line that chases that faster line, the signal line, okay? So in this case, the faster line is the black one. And you can see in this case, it's climbing now going over the zero line and it's now under buy mode. So it's now in buy mode and it complements what the moving average is telling you and also complements the breakout of the range of the pattern we're looking at. So now you've got two indicators in your favor, the, the moving average and the MACD. Finally, let's look at the RSI. The question here is, is this stock price overbought? And so if we look down here, you can see that although the RSI is climbing, we are not in the overbought threshold yet. And as I told you, if the stock is not overbought, then that means there's still some upside that can be shown in here. So if it's not overbought, again, it also gives you a positive reading. You could also ask, do you spot any divergence? Well, since this high here is higher than this high here, there is no divergence. So in that respect, this guy still tells you thumbs up, things are okay. MACD says thumbs up, all is okay. And this tells you it's thumbs up because it's above the moving average. So ideally, by looking at these three indicators, they tell you go ahead, follow your breakout, buy the stock. And let's see if the stock price climbed. And did did it did climb. So from this area, you can see that it stretched out a little bit more. Now, as we went through in time, let's now look at the indicators again. One, the price is still standing above your moving average, okay? Now, one thing you should also, you can also use is how far over the moving averages is this? Because remember, this is your support. So if it would say this is all the way up here and your, your next moving average line is way down here, that means your next support line may be too far and risk that you might take might be too big. But in this case, it's not that far yet. Now, what is your MACDC? Did it cross down? It did not. Although, yes, it's slowing down, but no cross down has taken place as of yet. And as long as this does not cross down, that means you don't indicate a sell trigger. But we have a problem. We do have an overbought situation now in our RSI. That is the reason why you see it seems to be banking off because some people are taking its profits. But the moving average says, yes, it might be taking its profit, but no support break has taken place. The uptrend is secure. The MACD tells you uptrend is still secure, although it is losing momentum. I advise to hold. This guy advises to hold. The uh, RSI tells you stop buying. If you want, you can take a little bit of profit. Now, let's see what happened. If you see, it, the price continued to move higher. Okay, in, that, in such a situation, let's see what happened to me. If I did take some profit, then I would still have at least 70% of my position in that can still warrant making money into this strong uptrend. If I happen to have held it, then I'm still A-OK. -okay. Now up here, let's make an assessment again with all the indicators. 
here's your here's your price it's a bit far now from your moving average right and because of that i'm going to get a bit more edgy now because my risk is if i buy here it will go down here on the minimum next let's look at your macd now this macd is not looking good at all in fact your your momentum in your your macd is already drawn down a cross down is now taking place and that's warning you already something is going on here and that the seller might be intensifying third indicator telling me the rsi this guy is still overbought. And so this is still overbought. This guy's telling you cross down taking place. Moving average, no support break yet, but the price from where it is is too far from the moving average, also suggestive of an overbought situation. And now I come to get a bit more alarmed. In a case like this, I will start my profit taking campaign. Uh, maybe I can go all the way up to 50% to do it. And just in case that this moving average breaks, I will unload everything that I have because if that breaks, I know this will cross down more and this will start to turn down even more. So let's see what happened. And you can see what happened. The MACD suggestive of correction coming in place. And sure enough, here comes your correction. I took some of my profits here and I will take more as this moving average breaks and I will just continue to stay out of this because a correction over here is still being uh, shown to me as a sell mode continues and coming from an overbought condition that tells me a lot of people are caught up here. It may take some time before this correction uh, finishes itself. Where do I look for potential correction spots? If this breaks, I will look for support here. If this breaks, I will look next for support here. And this is how we use a combined multi-indicator system to review our assessment of the trend. Let's look at Ayala Land. So Ayala Land is in a downtrend as you see over here. If you notice into a downtrend, several times it made attempts to try to recover, but the moving averages above it seem to be blocking its path. And so you can see this moving average are all acting as resistance now. Now, let's go all the way back up to where prices are here. As you see prices, let's ask ourselves a question. Is the price above or below the moving averages? The answer is it's below them. It's below the shorter, medium, and longer term moving average. And given that context, that means all three time, time periods are telling me I should be staying away from this guy, right? Because neither uptrend are seen in those three time frames. Let's consult our MACD. Our MACD did show some buy move here, but you can clearly see it's way below the zero line, which you see in this spot here. And now you're even seeing a possible cross down uh, situation. So this shows edginess because it's still below the zero line. Now, are we oversold in this case? No. All right. So if it's not oversold, there's really no big reason for this to go, you know, erupting upwards this way. And so given this context, it did show a bit of a rally, but now it seems to be bouncing through an area pattern, but it's trading below the moving average. So the trend environment is not right for me to enter. So let's see what happens with this stock. And look what happens. There was a bit of a rally. It rallied a little bit more the MACD. It moved up here and now you're crossing back down again. And now what do you see? You see a consolidation in price now. The top seem to be apparent. The lows seem to be apparent. And if I want to draw, I could even draw a rectangle here to tell you what the event is. So if I have a rectangle brewing right now, what should I be doing with my MACD? I shouldn't be paying too heavy attention to it. But even now, this is not looking too good, right? I may not be oversold anymore. And so if it's not oversold, it doesn't really mean that this needs to rally so much more. And next, the price has just fallen back down below the moving averages again. And so in this condition, this tells me to stay out. And I will stay out of this until one day I can see prices breach above the rectangular zone or breach the moving averages to give me back an uptrend to see what I want. And I wanna see this MACD go over the zero line to tell me I'm now also into an uptrend. So these are how you put these indicators together and take advantage of how to be able to put them together to give you a much more full assessment of the market condition. Unbiased, just plainly what prices are showing me. And now I can easily filter any stock we have. If it took us a minute to study these two stocks based on this, that means if it took me a minute to study this whole page, that's 30 seconds per stock. And if I want to study 30 stocks, all the 30 companies in an index, it should take me only a short period of time to be able to do that as well. One day when you're good enough, you can look at a picture of a chart and in one second, you should make a declaration of what you ought to do. All right, 
Now, earlier I said I might be able to preview some other technical indicators, but I'll only go very quickly in here because I just want to show you how useful some of this can be and where to be able to find them. So another example of an overlay type of indicator is a Bollinger Band. Now, a Bollinger Band is the three lines you see here. Now, the red line is like a resistance line. The blue line is like a support line. And this gray line is like the mid zone of both. So this is a dynamic moving line. Think of it as a dynamic moving channel where it tries to gauge the upper boundary and lower boundary of price. Right? Uh, I do, we don't have to go to greater de detail with this. Maybe one day we'll do another specialized webinar for you to talk about uh, specialized indicators. Uh, but for now, I just want to show you how, how you can use such indicators and you can plot it along your graph. In a downtrend, the way to use a Bollinger Band is to be able to look at the, where the trend condition is. If the trend condition is down, more likely and most of the time, the price that you will see here will trade roughly in between the middle ground and the lower end of that particular Bollinger Band. Okay, so in a normally a downtrend, it's very rare for it to go all the way up to the red line. If it does, that means a trend change is taking place. If you notice what happened here. So in a downtrend, it stayed there. And so in a downtrend, the whole idea is to use the middle ground of this channel as your resistance line in a downtrend. And in an uptrend, use that middle line as your support line. So in this case, we're in a downtrend. So you should be selling closer to the middle ground and using this as your oversold indicator. And when it rallies back here, sell more. Okay, now when the trend changes, you change your attitude. So now we have got prices jumping above the middle zone, reaching up to the red line. We will only do this if trends are starting to point up. And so it pulls back down closer to your uh, gray area, rallies back to the red line resistance, and now pulling, pulling back to the gray area should be opportunities for you to look for potential buys. So that's how a Bollinger Band is used. But this is an example of an overlay because you see I overlaid it along directly with the price as against this indicator. Now this indicator is called a DMI or an ADX indicator. That's this one here. Again, it also has three lines. Normally, there is a line called uh, a red one and either a blue or a green one. Now, normally the red line is a negative area or what we call the, the negative uh, uh, DMI. And this line over here tells you that if it is above the green line, tells you that there is a negative trend uh, that is prevailing here. So again, we're looking at the same stock, which is Meralco. A downtrend is coming in. That's the reason that the red line is above the green line. When the trend changes and you see it seems to be going up, look what happens. The green line crosses over the red line and tends to stay over the red line. That's how you know. Are you? It's like the. It's like an. It's like the. Um, MACD showing you a positive trend and negative trend. So in this case, if the green line is above the red, you're in a positive trend. If the red line is above the green, you have a negative trend. Now this third line, this black line you see here is what we call the ADX line. The DMI is actually these two readings that you see. The ADX is this uh, black line that you see here. Now the ADX line is a force index line. That means it's trying to tell you how strong the trend is. Now, it does not care about direction, right? So if you see this black line, if you see the black line picking up, that means momentum is increasing. But please remember, it doesn't care whether it's up or down. What will tell you up or down is this red and green line. So in this case, it's down this because the red is above the green. But when this is picking up like this, that means momentum is increasing. If this black line is dropping down like this, that means momentum is decreasing. So let's interpret this area here. Red line over green line tells you I'm in a negative trend or downtrend. Now, the four or your ADX line going down tells you that downtrend is losing force. Okay, that's what this is trying to tell you. And that's why it's anticipating a potential reversal condition here. Now, when this shoots up, the uptrend now will change. As you see over here, it climbed up enough to be able to turn the tide on the trend. And now there's a bit of strong trend here, but then it weakened because of that. You can see momentum turn again and it's starting to be able to head downwards. What happened? Stock starts to consolidate. In a consolidation, there is no momentum. And that's the reason why your force index line or ADX is going down. Once a breakout takes place and prices seem to be moving back up, you can see that your ADX is starting to pick up. But this time, this is an 
this is an upward force in what trend? The green line is above the red line telling you you're now into an uptrend. Okay, so again, uh, we can one day go very specifically into what these indicators can do. I'm just showing you how powerful these indicators are if you know how to use them well, especially if you attempt to be able to put them together. Let's use one more. Now, the other indicator is called the stochastics indicator. Now, stochastics is this indicator down here. It works just like an MACD, so to speak. However, this is a combination of like an MACD built with an RSI, right? So it does two things. It records short-term momentum, and it also gives you an overbought, oversold indicator. So it's a combination of two indicators in one. So if you see here, we have an overbought line, which is gray line here. We have an oversold line, which is this bottom range here. And you have two lines that are going, crossing above each other and crossing below each other. And this, like an MAC, gives you a cross up, which means a buy, and a cross down means a sell. Now, one little note, a stochastics indicator is for short-term trading, okay? And when I say short-term, you shouldn't be looking for very, very radical periods here. They move very, very, very quickly. And that's why you note here, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So it's really for short-term trading and not for medium or long-term trading. However, if you want to use the overbought, oversold gauge, that can help you, just like an RSI can. So for example, if you see this crossing over going up, you will likely come after a major correction in that it has now built inside enough power to be able to put, pick up again. But look, after a little bit of a rally, the stochastics goes all the way up to an overbought indicator. And because of that, that's the reason why you're seeing it's winding here for a while. Okay, and once this finishes its wind, then maybe it can punch up. But what this guy wants to do is he wants to come down maybe a little bit more here before it tells you that enough Correction has taken place before the next advance will be will be happening. Okay, so I previewed you do the Bollinger Band, the DMI, and the Stochastics as added uh, uh, tools that you might want to have a look at. Uh, maybe one day, like I said, we'll cover this in a different type of seminar. But the engagement of this is using technical indicators and how if you combine them along with prices, they can prove to be very useful. So know when to use these types of area patterns. Remember, majority of in these types of indicators are momentum-based indicators, and they work very poorly when consolidations come. Try to be able to use two to three indicators together so that it can give you a fullness in terms of it. You, each indicator you add there gives you more confirmation to your assessment of a trend. But please, try not to use more than three at a time. Because if you have too many indicators, you don't know who you're going to be listening to. And here's where many people joke, you become too much of an analysis that it paralyzes you, right? Analysis paralysis. So use two or three indicators, that's good enough for your particular standard. Use them hand in hand with classical anal analysis techniques. So that means classical analysis involves the use of trend lines, support and resistance, uh, corrections and area patterns. Those are what we call classical formations. Technical indicators are a new chapter into technical analysis. So that's why uh, we separated that entirely. But use them together, then they can confirm each other and that should give you a much more fuller assessment of the market condition. And of course, Test to see which combinations work well. Now, the reason I put this down inside is because you know some of you may be trading small cap issues, mid caps or large caps. Large caps tend to be slower, not all the time, but as a general rule, they are. Smaller caps move very quickly. The other thing is that liquidity inside smaller stocks are very, very low. And because of that, they could easily jump. They could go up 20, 30, 50% in a day and continue moving tomorrow. And that's why some newbies love to trade this particular stock because it can present an opportunity. However, newbies, I would suggest that you master your indicators well so you make sure that if you're going to go jump around like a trapeze artist in a circus, you have your safety net underneath. Because if you don't have that, all it takes is one big mistake and you're out of the game. So it's very important for you to know the tools that you have and make sure that that parachute you have is always worn. And when we talk about into our next webinar, when we talk about creating the trading plan and we talk about risk, we'll be able to make sure that you know how to be able to protect yourself no matter what it is that you do. But please, 
the first grain over here is try to make a good clear sense of your environment before you go into battle make an assessment of the battlefield and that's what everything we've learned up to today so far stands for you're making an assessment of your environment so you know should this be the battle i should be jumping into or are two sides shooting each other and if i jump into right now i'm going to get stuck in between like a consolidation and so you want to wait for the situation where one side of the war seems to be winning already and that gives you better chances of following up with that because you will be lined up with the victor not against of course the one that will drive you down okay so let's sum up what we talked about we said technical indicators will help assess trend strengths and we said that uh, uh, if we see cracks into these indicators, it can also alert us of potential corrective elements and how far down should this corrective intent be. We studied three types of indicators. We looked at overlays such as your uh, uh, Bollinger Band and such as your uh, moving averages. We looked at momentum gauges, just like your MACD and your stochastics and your DMI. And we studied an oscillator, which is like your RSI and also your, your uh, stochastics indicator. Put together, these three indicators gives you a depth of perception that many new traders will normally not have. Know how to use them together like a filtering system. If you have three indicators in your favor, that should give you a two thumbs up to be able to follow on your trend move. If you have one indicator telling you uh, not so good, but the two are still okay, you can still get away with it and more likely you'll still make money in that trade. But if two indicators tell you no, and one indicator tells you, yes, I will look for another trade because I'm looking for something that will put much, much more meat into what I'm doing and give me a better chance of walking out in here making money. OK, so we come to be able to complete our subject matter for today in terms of technical indicators. So I hope you get to practice them quite well. And uh, I hope that you're still good with your uh, robustness with what we talked about so far. So next week, we will talk about the trading plan. And we're going to talk about how to be able to build a plan or plan these trades that we do. It's important for us to be able to gauge this. I don't want to just jump into the market and say, okay, whatever happens, I will just hit. It shouldn't be that way. Your mind should be mentally prepared to be able to attack whatever happens today. You should also, like I said, assess your battlefield and understand if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. If this happens, this is how I'm going to get out. So you should know how to plan your entry, how to plan your exit. And always make sure that the management of risk comes along with anything you do in trading. Because at the end of the day, something out of the blue could happen, pull our perspective out of whack, completely go against us, and we have to be ready to be able to submit to what we have to do. You cannot put yourself in a situation where prices are falling, you're stuck in a position, and you're stunned, you don't know what to do, and all you do is just say, bahala na, and I hope something good happens to me. That's a driver who's taken his hand out of the steering wheel and says, I hope I don't bump anything and I don't crash. So please, two hands always in the wheel. The control element will always have to be there. Use your gauges. You know how to do that now inside your car and use that speedometer. Use your signal lights. Use your rear view mirror. Put them all together to make your driving experience a nice and profitable one. All right, so I leave you again, and I'd like to say thank you for those who managed to be able to watch her, and I hope that you managed to be able to learn a lot from today's session into technical indicators.